Welcome back to another live stream with David Frangione. How are you, my friend? Doing great. Great to be here. Hello, everyone. Awesome. So, David, I was talking to you, you know, last time after our last live stream, I'm like, we should do a live stream on the process of choosing speakers and recording studios, because I don't think a lot of consumers think about this. You know, they get they get their favorite electronics, they get their favorite loudspeakers in the house, and they want to get something as authentic as possible in their house. But most people don't think about, well, what is authentic? What is our favorite music being mixed on? And are those speakers as good, better, or worse than the very best consumer gear that we're listening to in our own homes? And that's why I wanted to bring you in on this, because obviously you have a lot of experience in this domain. Well, and, and you know, as soon as you and I started talking about it, we realized the proverbial rabbit hole that we were going down and that this is really, you know, this this particular segment we're doing today is we'll call it part one and and it's an overview and um and so we'll keep it topical and and kind of enter into the what in a linear fashion right so part one and then you know later on we'll do another time we'll do part two etc and you add them all together and you'll have the complete solution at that point for information that you want to consider uh, when putting together a studio and and a playback system in that studio uh, but you know, here we are on part one, and uh, you know, as you know, I prepared some slides, and um, and we'll just go through. You know, this process is very similar to what I go through when I speak with clients initially on determining, uh, you know, what studio are we building, and uh, because of course the speakers are you know a huge component to, uh, you know, what ultimately is going to be created. And now you're talking not just two channel music anymore. You're talking about building a studio even for Atmos mixing, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, again, it depends. Every studio is different, but yeah, nowadays, um, you know, in the '90s, it was pretty rare to build a surround studio. Since most of the studios I create um, are uh, music, you know, they're for artists, musicians, et cetera, people who are interested in having a music studio as opposed to a film scoring or a post-production or a movie mixing studio, uh, which are all, you know, there's plenty of those as well. But my lane has been mostly music. So 5.1 and surround sound was not really that commonplace. Um, but nowadays, as you say, you know, now with Atmos and spatial audio and immersive, um, you know, now music studios are uh, embracing multi-channel and now they're you know going beyond studio uh, stereo yeah i got gotcha. you all right so i'm going to share my screen here we got the powerpoint presentation that we can go over let me just get um us on the sides as well so you can see in case you want to talk with your hands because you are italian like me <laughs> in okay. case i want to I always talk with my hands. It's pretty much a necessity, right? It is. It is. It's second nature. So DavidFrangioni.com, as you guys know, uh, David's no stranger to the channel, but I just wanted to put your URL out here for those that are interested. Maybe they want to create a recording studio. This is how you get a hold of David right here. There he is, David the drummer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, we're going to do a little history lesson. Okay. two-year-old okay do you want to narrate this david however you want to do it you know two years old i was diagnosed with retinoblastoma which most of the time people are blind from that but i was very lucky that i only became half blind so i've only seen it out of my left eye since i was a little kid wow a lot of trauma a lot of uh, challenges um played on phone books and tabletops as a drummer until my parents got me to use roger's drum kit which is what that picture is uh, started from scratch. My dad was a meat cutter. My mom was a legal secretary. So we didn't have any connections, but, you know, I had a lot of passion and a lot of, uh, you know, ambition and wanted to, uh, you know, go further in life through music. And as it turns out later, technology. Gotcha. Helped develop Pro Tools, worked with those guys real early on. Of course, that's now the de facto standard, but then we didn't know it was going to be. But I, I had you know a part in in that evolution wow that's an old mac design right there 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, that would have been like a Mac two or an S an SC or, uh, you know, who knows early mid, mid, mid to late eighties. Right. Some clients, you know, been very blessed to work with a lot of great clients. That's There's awesome. Shakira, them. especially. Wow. Gene Simmons. Is that Gene Simmons? That's Gene Simmons and kiss, you know, yeah. Yeah, great. And you have a book about Clint Eastwood as well. Two books with Clint. Two yep. books. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Clint Eastwood Two Icon books. and Clint Eastwood Icon Revised and Expanded Edition. If you like Clint Eastwood, they're they're really coffee table books. They're a lot of a lot of fun to read to to look at. Yep. Yep. Ozzy, ten years with Oz, two seasons on the Osbournes, as it turned out. Just you know, happened to be there while they were recording, so I got into a couple of little shots. Very cool. Yep. Aerosmith, you know, still work with the guys. Um, started with them in 89. It's been a great journey. Yeah. He's kind of like, he's not doing anything musical now, right? I mean, I haven't really followed. Well, they have a Vegas him. residency. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah, so they're doing a lot of live live stuff now that COVID's starting to subside. Gotcha. Um, and there's just a bunch of different projects. Randy Jackson. And Randy Jackson, I like that. Yeah, he's great. What, a, yeah. what an amazing guy. He's just, he's incredible. He was the basis for Journey, wasn't he, at some point? Yeah, yeah and a lot of other people played on Mariah's Christmas album. And, I mean, it's iconic. And of course, I think he did here. some, did he do stuff with, like, Herbie Hancock? Or I know he did some jazz stuff, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's just a monster musician, producer. Yeah. Um, then, of course, you know, the world discovered him uh, on American Idol. Then there's yep. Crash, my third book, which Clint did not work on me. Uh, with me on but he was kind enough to hold it He's oh, a musician. Cool. you know clint's a great musician oh i didn't know that yeah yeah and then modern drummer there you go number one drum resource since 1977 if you're a drummer check out modern drummer.com awesome and we're all here today because we're students of audio and sound and our pursuit of the best sound that we can possibly create and uh and listen to yep so now what studio is this that's a pro so the upper right is ozzy's second studio that i did for him and the left side and the bottom right the credenza and the console are a studio uh private studio uh wow. for for a client and then it's you know that's a good shot gene um on the left to show what we're going to talk about in a second, which are, those are the three kind of what we'll call tiers of monitoring in a studio. And so the, the closest speakers with the white woofer, uh, those are essentially Yamaha NS10s. Those, those are what we would call near field. Yep. And then right behind them, the gentle X kind of to the side behind our um, midfield. And then the speakers soffit mounted in the wall um, that you can kind of see, they kind of blend into the black fabric, but those would be room monitors, uh, mm -hmm. large, full range, loud volume playback soffit mounted monitors. So those are the three, and, and this was a very professional studio. Um, so it had all three flavors of monitoring as, as a pro studio, a really high end pro studio would have. So right. we want to we want to reference that picture. Just keep an image of that in our mind, everyone, when we're talking about the different types of speaker uh, choices and and what what kind of range they they fall into in the studio application. So when you're mixing music, uh, obviously you're going to try it out on all three different kinds of monitors to see how it sounds under all those different conditions, right? That's exactly right. And and what you're mixing on most of the time are probably the Yamahas, the smallest guys, and the Genelec midfield. So you're, you're going between those two. Depending on what your comfort zone is, some guys choose the Yamahas most of the time. Some guys choose the mid mid uh, midsize midfield, you know, some, some most of the time. And then you go to the room monitors, of course, just to check low bass and different listening volumes and and as, as well accuracy but um you know it's a completely different sound in in a sense to what you're mixing for you know that oh. the key to a studio is you're you're trying to mix for all playback so from headphones to mono to the car 
to a, a reference system, you know, it's just this huge range of radio or streaming, um, you know, where there'll be additional compression added, uh, whether it's audio compression or whether it's bit rate uh, compression. So you've just got a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different playback types that the same mix has to sound good on. Well, I would imagine like if you're doing a lot of the mixing on those little Yamahas or the Genlix, they don't have a lot of bass. So, I mean, do you add a sub to that too? Or do you check the bass with the big monitors, the ones that are built into the wall? Is that how you determine if a, if a mix has enough bass? A lot. Of, yes. Yes. On the, on the soffit mounted. Yes. And, so, and yes to subwoofers on the midfield. Not okay. typically on the Yamahas because you're listening for a different kind of thing there. But yeah, you don't, you can't hear 20 or 30 or 40 hertz or even accurately 50 hertz on the yeah. Yamahas to really hear what's going on. But that's not their purpose, right? Their purpose is to to get the blend and to and to hear how it's going to sound under most systems which don't have that level of accurate playback, right? Most systems can't play down to 30 hertz or 40 hertz but yet you need your mix to sound clean you know all the way you know down to the to the very very bottom and not only sound accurate rich clean full and have the proper body but not have mud down there and not have excessive really really low end mud under 20 hertz mm -hmm. um so you you know you need to hear where that is and use um you know high pass um to make sure when you're doing your mix that you don't have anything super, super subharmonic going on. That's just going to just turn into mud, yeah, but we, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> this is the rabbit hole, right? That you and I are talking about. So, um, so let's start with, this is an overview studio speakers. Um, and let's, you know, context is everything. So the reason this is the first, you know, the first, component to this process is that it really is everything. Um, I have a lot of conversations on a daily basis um, about building recording studios or playback environments um, with different people with different needs all over the world. And the language that's used, the descriptions that are used initially when I'm contacted and this is in most cases, obviously, there's no such thing as, you know, every person saying the same thing. But there's it's enough that we can use this as data points and, and be accurate that the initial conversation from someone reaching out to me, although virtually all of them have different needs, they're in different parts of the world in some cases, uh, you know, they're they're all over the map as far as what they're up to. They all use the same language and description. So I've learned, like, I've got to make sure we get this. I bring context into the conversation because they don't have enough experience in most cases to know that we have to start really refining what is this conversation. So the first thing is hobby or pro. Are we building this studio for you to play for your friends or for your own personal enjoyment as a talking point in a house? or you know, a myriad of reasons that someone might want a recording studio or a playback studio, um, but it's hobby, right? So that, that's really important. They're not making records. They're not being hired by people to, you know, to work on music in what we'll call a pro environment. So if it's in fact a hobby, the playback doesn't have to be extremely accurate. It has to sound great to them. And it has to provide enjoyment and entertainment. And of course, it has to fit with whatever their budget is uh, for this environment that they want to create, which usually is a blend of aesthetics and uh, and speakers. So that's the hobbyist. So a quick question for you, David. Now, I don't want to dive too far off topic, but this is a good question. Obviously, there's a difference between sound production versus sound reproduction when you're actually making the music. Mm -hmm. And with sound, um, I'm sorry, with sound production, when you're doing sound production, you know, you use tube amplifiers because people like the colored sound, especially with guitars. But when you're doing sound, when you're mixing the recordings and you're doing this in a studio, don't you want to use the most accurate electronics possible? Or do you actually use 
like a tube amp or an amp that you know may be colored because maybe the artist likes the flavor that it's adding while you're laying the tracks down. No, we want the former of the two. We want accurate. We want to hear as as you know what's really going on. It's it's right. the lab. It's under the microscope, if you will. Now that wouldn't apply to the hobby scenario because gotcha. a hobbyist right isn't typically mixing and if they are mixing the very definition of hobby is that you know they're not being hired and and it doesn't have to be reference quality now where there's a hybrid of this hobby or pro is that if you have someone who's who's a hobbyist but they're a high level hobbyist and they actually have pro needs so they're not being hired by anybody it's not a commercial space or they're not you know, an artist that makes a living from music and, you know, they want this environment, but they have, that's their expectation. They, they want to have a pro studio in their home or in their, you know, warehouse or office or whatever, wherever they want it. But it's, so it's, so that's like a hobbyist that wants a pro studio. So that we immediately shift um, you know, our goals into the pro category. So it doesn't stay hybrid for long. But I have done a number of those where they're for hobbyists, but we use pro level, um, you know, design factors. Gotcha. So hobby or pro. Um, so next thing is, so pro is bolded there because now we've said, okay, well, we've already defined generally what we're going to consider for hobbyists now what about a pro well a pro stereo or surround or both as you said earlier gene very uh accurately that a lot of people are going uh you know with surround systems now uh you know in in their studios so we could do a hybrid uh, my own professional studio is a hybrid it has stereo speakers it has uh, near field stereo, it has midfield stereo, and then the midfield stereo are also part of an entire Atmos uh, immersive audio uh, setup. So, um, you know, so you're going to have one or the other or both. Um, what style of music are you going to be playing? Now, if it's a commercial studio, you could it could be anything. So you have to, you know, you have to kind of plan for the most extreme you know, very high dynamic range, classical and very high dynamic range with, with very deep bottom at loud levels, rap and pop. If it's not a commercial studio, then the the owner that, you know, I'm talking to about, you know, what what are we going to do for, you know, I'm, I'm going to start considering what speaker choices and, and where we go. Uh, they'll know, you know, what kind of music do I like to listen to and what do I really expect from this system? And the same thing with volume needs. Um, you know, volume needs are important, especially um, really in, in, in a home or commercial studio, but for both. You know, you really, there are some home studios I've built where, you know, the, the expectation of the owner is, you know, a modest volume. It, you know, they can lean on it a little bit, but it, you know, it's, it's not crazy loud. Uh, and then there are other, um, clients with whom I've worked that, you know, volume is really important and, um, and the systems have to play really, really loud. Um, I remember this isn't relevant to the speakers, but it's relevant to a, a very similar topic. When I was building Ozzy's first studio, one of the things he said to me, he had never had a recording studio before. He'd never had his own studio. So here, here we are in 2003 and it's the height of the Osborne show. And here's this iconic artist, you know, with Black Sabbath and his own solo career. And I can't believe with all the iconic recordings he's made that he's never had a recording studio himself. But in fact, he hadn't. And, um, and he, you know, I think one of the things that prompted him at that time is because he, the show was so popular, he really couldn't leave his house much. He was more famous than ever. So we had a bunch of meetings and we were putting together the blueprint. One of the things he expressed was, I need a headphone system that is extraordinarily loud. Whatever the loudest headphone system you ever built was, I want it louder. So I actually took a Bryston 4B, right? Now we know that, you know, that powers, you know, some, that's a lot of power uh, for headphones. And I took 
I, I modified a headphone system where we were only amplifying it, um, you know, at the Bryston, and then we had a volume attenuator, and then we had headphones that were impedance matched to the whole system, so they really played loud and powerful. And I remember he was on Ozfest tour when we were putting together all of the details for the studio before we went into construction. And he and he asked me, you know, can you come out and play the headphone, bring the headphone system, and I want to hear it. So I bring, you know, and of course in a studio there's multiple locations where the headphones will be played. So I, you know, he just needed to hear one set of headphones through, you know, one amp. You know, what is this going to sound like? One station, we'll call it. So I bring it out. He's staying at Four Seasons in in some city. I fly out. I put the thing together in his suite, and he comes over and. And I have a CD player, right? Because this is 2003. So the iPod existed, but it wasn't as popular as, as it became. So I had a CD player with one of his songs, one of his discs. So he really knew it well. And I put it into the system and put the headphones on. And I'm adjusting the volume. And, I, and let's say the system goes all the way up to, you know, uh, five o'clock, right? If, you, if it starts at six and goes, clockwise you know goes all the way around to five o'clock so i start at six start turning it seven eight nine ten o'clock and at at about eleven o'clock i could and i knew how loud it would play of course right because i had done all the testing and all the measurements and stuff i can hear the music clearly standing in the room not having <laughs> headphones on i can hear his headphones at eleven o'clock and he's he's got his hand up with his thumb pointing up like louder louder oh and he's God. he's giving me the cue like how loud he wants it until he's satisfied and we're at the point there were a number of people in in the room his entourage and we're at the point where by like two o'clock everybody is throwing their hands up you know the music you can hear it in the hallway and it's it's so loud the headphones are keeping up with it and it's so just you can't even no one else could even put the headphones on at that point they were so loud and then he goes one more and everybody's gasping and then he gives me the choke sign like stop takes the headphones off looks at me goes an explicative great wow and we so got it and that was uh, he did it. we got the headphone volume what he wanted but i mean there's that's a one off need you know but that's just a long story example of how you know, you really want to understand what the volume levels and expectations yeah. are. Of who so you are. Ozzy's got some serious hearing damage is what you're telling me. Well, he had some serious need for volume. You know, that's <laughs> what he wanted. Wow. Interesting story. I mean, it, it makes sense when you think about someone that's been a rocker all those years. In the early days, they probably didn't use a lot of hearing protection. You know, we just, they didn't really know. He liked it loud. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, he's had played so many concerts. Yeah. So now we have the speaker types, and we touched on this when we were looking at the photo of the studio at, at, the, at the beginning there, where they had all three types. I put some brands. There's there's more than this. This is you know these are not by any means the only brands that uh that that studios use, but these are some of the most common ones. Uh, the NS10s, the the Yamahas, which are now Chris Lord Alge has a um uh you know his own version called the CLA 10s, which are modeled after the NS 10s that he's mixed on a million times. Of course, he's a brilliant engineer. Um, and uh, those are the one, those are the only ones that I put a model because that's actually a standard, you know, like most studios have NS 10s have had them forever. At some point they'll probably become a little passe, but they've been around for so many years um, that that's why I, called out model numbers there but the rest of them are brands because you know there's all kinds of options within those brands and other brands uh, but it's the types that we really want to focus on so you have the near field these are the speakers that are closest to the engineer in the studio at the console um, usually the speakers that are used the most in during mix um, I put room monitors next, but if we're going in terms of size, mid-size would actually be next. Um, so these are still on the console bridge, um, typically a little further away or a little wider than um, than the near field. And uh, they play louder, more full range, more accurate. Again, you know, engineers will choose by taste 
what it is that they want for you know what model and, and what brand etc um genelec for a long time genelec 1031s were you know some of the most commonplace uh you know mid-sized monitors but you know now genelec has new monitors and new models and things have evolved but still this mid-size monitor a lot of times paired with a subwoofer as you mentioned mentioned earlier when you get the mid-size um and then room monitors now room monitors are soffit mounted play very loud full range sometimes with a sub sometimes without because they don't need one but most of the time with a sub especially if wrap and pop um, are needed for playback and room monitors you really only see in the highest end pro studios most of the time studios have near field and mid-size and sometimes uh, a studio will only have one set of speakers um, and then they'll reference the rest on headphones and that's usually mid-size so they kind of get the best of both worlds they get enough volume and enough bass response especially if they add a sub and and they're near field so they're uh you know they're able to make mix judgments um you know without you know with with kind of balancing the room with uh with the speakers and having them close enough and they're kind of one size fits all in that situation you know it's kind of funny i look at i was just looking up some ns10 stuff i mean that speaker's been around since the 80s and you could still if you look at them on ebay there's people still selling those speakers for like a thousand bucks and if you look at the reviews a lot of people complain that they're very bright kind of uh they are pro, yeah they're not a great sounding speaker but they're yet not. No. but yet they're still being used to mix music yeah and have been <laughs> because everybody knows what the mix we all know what they sound like and and they they represent one facet of what systems in the real world will sound like including radio and you know transmitted uh music mm -hmm. you know whether it's streamed or, or radio or television or whatever so they they have their place but part of their place is just because everybody knows them and so if you go from one studio to another you know because they're near field and they're close enough even with whatever room acoustics are going on among all these different studios you have uh you know a reference point that at least has some familiarity right so everybody that's the one speaker everybody has um yeah way back in the 70s and 80s there was another speaker and it was usually a mono speaker and it was a really little tiny speaker called the aura tone you remember those no you used to see them way back and again it was that kind of thing where where it was just something that everybody knew what it kind of sounded like in especially in mono so you just had it there because it was a common reference point and years later all the engineers we would all joke and call it the horror tone because it was a, a god-awful sounding speaker but right. it was you knew kind of what the mix was doing just because you knew what that speaker sounded like so much and it's the same thing with ns10s interesting so now console and acoustics so speak so this is again why we're talking about context being so crucial because you can't take in headphones you can take the whole world out of the equation and just pick a set of headphones and that's what it is but with speakers you you can't you've got a room and and then within that room you've got acoustics and in a setup where you you're going to have an actual studio you're going to have some kind of console or work surface so all so now those those elements those three elements we'll call it console even though we could call it work surface but rather than keep calling it you know uh you know two things all the time let's just as a placeholder for this conversation let's call it console in the past it was always a console now it's control surface or various other things so we'll call it console so you've got console, you've got the speakers, and you got the acoustics in the room itself. And mm -hmm. you can't choose one and disregard the others, which again is why context is everything. You've got to look at all three and, and decide on the best way forward and how you're going to get the best results and especially the results that the client has as an expectation based around those three factors so that's why immediately a speaker conversation especially in the pro lane has to now include console and acoustics so let's let's 
back up for a second. And what you said before is the reason why people use the Yamaha NS10 is because it's a known reference that you can go from studio to studio and you can listen to a mix and you can know what to expect because you know how that speaker sounds. Right. Okay. So what about the acoustics of the listening space? Are there guidelines when you're designing a recording studio that you should have an RT60 decay time between, I don't know, 200 to 500 milliseconds? Is there a standard kind of room acoustic environment when you're building these studios so there could be more consistency when you're going from one to the other? Well, absolutely. Um, but, you know, there's so many different studio designs from no design where someone takes a studio. This is not anything I would be involved in, just disclosure, but, you know, these are still the factors to answer your question. You've got no design rooms where the person just did it themselves uh, or inherited a room and just kind of went in there and started working all the way up to a properly designed studio uh, which is my lane. And then within my lane, there's lots of other guys who design and build studios besides me. So you've got all of these different possibilities and there isn't, you know, yes, there, there are, that could be another, uh, you know, episode that we do together on, you know, studio acoustics and yeah. commonalities and, and guidelines and that kind of thing. Standards, I guess we'll call them, but uh, you know, there's uh, you know, there's, everybody there isn't really like one way everything's going to sound so you've got um you know you've got a that's that's the ns10s the idea behind using them is it kind of neutralizes all of these spaces that you're referring to that are all different and it's like well how do i you know i'm, I'm at village recorders this day and i'm at capital another day and then i fly across uh to right track in New York. And, you know, even though I've worked in all those rooms, I, I need an instant kind of reference point of what's going on. And the NS10s kind of bring that, even though acoustically the rooms might all be different, the control rooms. It's, it's interesting because when I went to Boston and I visited Bowers and Wilkins, they took us to a recording studio there that it was all about, obviously it was Bowers and Wilkins. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought that that was more of a standard that, you know, I think Abbey Rose Studios uses Bowers and Wilkins as well, right? Yeah, I mean Abbey Road have they have all, all kinds of different choices. I'm sure there are NS tens there um as well. But yeah, I mean that's why there's more than one, you know, that's why there isn't just one the NS tens are really the only set of speakers that you could kind of say are everywhere. Whereas, you know, you have B and W, you have Genelec, you have Osberger, you have all these different, you know, way back in the in the eighties and nineties, you had the big Yuri. 809s and you know just it was you know there there are sea changes but the NS, ns10s have kind of stuck around as for stereo obviously in surround yeah. it, they wouldn't it wouldn't apply you know would you say setup. would you say that we've reached a point now where consumers that are into audio that maybe that watch this channel would you say that their playback systems their their loudspeakers have surpassed most of what you find in the recording studios these days in terms of fidelity in a lot of cases yes you know yeah. i i think what what and and one of the reasons for that besides budgets and that kind of thing uh and and some form of standardization is you know in a lot of rooms the acoustics are not really sorted and and there's a lot of reasons why it's not because I don't want them to be sorted, but you know, if you have a living room or a family yeah. room or, you know, you, you can only go so far. And so um, the speak, the, the higher end speakers and the higher end cabling and power conditioning and these things will kind of offset that and, and, and create this really great playback, um, you know, without, you know, some of the acoustics and they're made, you know, to sound the way somebody wants them to sound. You know, when you go from Vandersteens to Wilson's to Focal's to, you know, like you're part of what you're deciding on because uh, they're all great speakers. They all have incredible, uh, you know, playback capability and a reference quality level is you're deciding on what you like the best. There is a there's a very subjective component to this, which is why all these speaker manufacturers have been able to survive for so long, because there's mm -hmm. enough different tastes and enough different people that for playback, you know, no matter how reference quality 
you achieve, there's still a subjectivity to it, you know? So your reference is going to be different than someone else's reference, but each person enjoys that reference. That's what they like the sound of. And in a studio, you've got to serve all of the playback. So, you know, that's where you now need to start standardizing. You now need to start listening so that you've, so that the person on Wilson's, the person on Vandersteen's, the person on Steinway, the person on Genelec, you know, in their home or wherever, or if they're in their car and are listening through, a, you know, um, you know, some of these really, really high end car playback systems, um, you know, that, you know, that it still sounds great. And um, and there's you know there's there's an art to that which is in and that and that's a good point about the car because if you think about it now and not to get off too too far off topic but OEM car systems have have improved considerably over the last five to ten years Big to the time. point to the point now where doing uh, aftermarket car stereos is be, is not as lucrative as it used to be because why why mess with that stuff when you can go and get an upgrade package. And have everything integrated into the car and now you're getting even surround sound in the car too yeah mercedes has announced they're going to do proper atmos which is a game changer i'm working with a, a, a major car manufacturer to bring atmos in as well so i think we're going to see car audio finally go to where it really is capable of going and i mean if you look at the uh accessibility of spatial audio through apple devices right which are well over a billion devices i think mm -hmm. the last number i heard was like one seven or one eight billion um and you look at car audio now being able to adapt that properly and play back discrete um immersive because you have the speakers already so really uh, you know you've got the speakers so you have amplification now you, you just need to decode it and and you know get some of the other uh, algorithmic uh, elements into it, which is a much easier play than, uh, than it seems because you have, um, you know, you, you already have, uh, you know, all the speakers and the amps there. And yes, the room is very predictable. Double yeah, T. That's, that's a great, yeah, that's, that's a great, great point. You know, you really know yeah. exactly how, I mean, the only, obviously you have to, you know, uh, have idle, you have to have, you know, loud engine, you know, mid engine, you know, there's, you know, but that technology is, has been well developed now they just have to make it for multi-channel to kind of compensate for road noise and etc cetera, et cetera. yeah usually usually what i've noticed with cars is as the road noise gets louder you kind of need more bass too like a, a exactly. bass level yeah exactly. you have to compensate for it yes so yeah. this is another this is another interesting point i was always wondering this because i've spoken to some pretty famous musicians in the past not many of them have listened to their own music on really good playback systems. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Like maybe they've only been experienced, maybe they've only experienced their music like on a pair of NS10s and they haven't had like, you know, a really nice pair of Focals or, or, you know, some of the higher end speakers out there like Rebels or Perilisten yeah. or anything You'd like that. You'd be surprised how true that statement is. And uh, Christopher Porter says, I know a couple of famous musicians who only listen to music on average PA speakers. And yeah, I I've seen it a million times too. I mean, you're an audiophile reference quality playback. Ironically, since it's all based around the music that we're making, you would think that it would go hand in glove with the people that make it, but it's its own lane. People who are passionate about how something sounds mm -hmm. is not necessarily the same as someone who's passionate about playing guitar. So it's, uh, you know, sometimes they go together, but more often than not, they're really two dis distinctive lanes. You know what I think would be a great thing to do is is a, if we get more musicians on the channel, like I was, we were talking about maybe getting Pat Metheny, yeah. find out what they're using for playback. You know, someone like him who is so incredibly gifted as a musician, I'm wondering what what he's using in his own house when he listens to music. You know, I'm dying. <laughs> See, you're gonna blow the top off of this. You're gonna be so surprised. <laughs> I, I can't speak for Pat. I did work with him. Um, but I, I haven't been to his house, so I don't know what he's using there. But you're going to be very surprised just in general. And I, I've been to many, many rock stars' homes, either building studios, theaters, or just you know collaborating with them on something, and have seen most of their systems not be anywhere close to what our listeners have as a system because they're they're not quote unquote into it in that way. They're into right. their studio 
and they're into their music, of course, and they're into yeah. the touring, and they're into their rig. Their rig will sound amazing with a drum rig, keyboard rig, guitar rig, etc. But audio file playback is its own passion and lane. And as we know, it's extensive, takes a lot of passion and care, takes a lot of budget, takes a yeah. lot of time. This is something that you really have to be into. Obviously, you and I, you know, it's, it's a life's passion of ours and all of our listeners. But there's a lot of musicians who it's not a life's passion. Other elements I, of it I are. I bet but, you but, someone like Neil Young probably has a good audio playback system because he's been on record saying that he prefers vinyl and he prefers different kinds of recording. So I bet you someone like him probably pays more attention to the fidelity at his, at his own playback system. Yeah, remember Gavin Harrison? told us that great story about Neil Peart, who had an audio file system and was using Gavin's, one of Gavin's mixes as his reference, like we do in our world, taking our core references and going around and being able to instantly hear what one speaker sounds like to another because we have our library of, you know, what we're going to play back. Right. Of course, everybody plays Donald Fagan, Nightfly and or Asia, you know, Joe yeah. in Asia, right? But yeah. you know, there's more than that. But those are some of the staples. But you know, he was Neil was using uh, Gavin. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great story. So we got a question here for you that you might want to answer, uh, David. Ignoring the high end audio enthusiast or pro for a moment, most music is being played back on headphones. Should at least some tracks be recorded for that PB, if not straight up binaural playback? if not straight up by an oral. Well, they, and they are, you know, I mean, um, absolutely right. Roar of the tiger. Um, there is a, you know, there's a huge shift that's been going on now for about 15 years, really, but it's, it's, you know, in a major, major peak where it's at a major peak right now in terms of headphone uh, context, you know, so yes, headphone mixing on headphones, um you know it's it's a it's a staple now and and even a few years ago it wasn't nearly as much as it is now but now you can't finish a mix without uh you know really getting a good sense of what it sounds like on headphones and different types of headphones I'm well that's sure a lot of people appreciate gene in the past we it was all you'd go to the car right 80s 90s you brought your mix to the car Either mm -hmm. on C if either when CD burning became uh, possible and before that cassette, and you brought it to the car, and uh, and now that you know NS tens are kind of that, but in in a you know very real way, headphones are kind of today's car mix. So what's the so the NS ten is kind of a gold reference standard for near field monitors. What's the standard for headphones? Would it be like an AKG or? Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of different. Yeah, I mean, Neumann make great headphones. Sony, AKG, Sennheiser. Uh, yeah. You know, th there's not really one, you know, but what's important is that you really know what those headphones sound like. So, you know, the great thing about it is you go to any studio in the world, and as long as they have enough power going through that headphone amp that you're listening uh, and, their, and their signal path is clean, you know, you know, very quickly what your mix is sounding like in the headphones. And so that's, you know, even next level on, um, you know, what we do with near fields. But, you know, now, as Roar of the Tiger said, you know, that's how everybody's listening. I mean, yeah. you, you, if you think about music, it's, you know, it's headphones of some kind, you know, AirPods or, you know, whatever you want to call it, but in, you know, in-ear or over-ear and car. I mean, that's the majority of, how people listen to music nowadays um so you know you've got to your mix really has to translate uh you know very well there and that is a different you know you're making different decisions at the console um you know based on that right someone here saying that they think the gen like 830 8361 is the best studio monitor in the world nothing beats a coax yeah i love gen x yeah gen x great speakers yeah they make some great stuff they do interesting so forever what what are some of the um recording studios that you set up that you're most proud of and you know what for what reason like what did you do in a particular recording studio that turned out so well that almost you want to replicate that and do more of them 
I mean, they're all different, you know. Um, I can't say there's there's one favorite or, you know, I'll, I'll tell you among all of them what really um, keeps me charged up about, you know, still doing studios to this day, 35 years in, is that you look at the music that's made in them and the, and the goals that are accomplished in them because most of the studios I've done have been for artists. So they've immediately gone in and you know made records that then the whole world hears you know either entirely in that studio or partly in that studio you know maybe they you know wrote the songs and you know did some basic tracking and then maybe they went somewhere else and mixed or maybe they did the whole thing there and that's the most gratifying part of it to me is seeing um if we use ozzy you know let's take the first studio i built two studios for ozzy let's take the first one you know right off the bat it was as a huge ozzy fan my whole life and as a kid you know listening to black sabbath and then following ozzy on blizzard of oz and his solo stuff um to be able to have built ozzy's first studio you know what i mean you know when you do a first of anything especially of significance it's always exciting yeah uh, but that's a good example of where besides that you know the, the the real example in it is sitting down understanding what ozzy wanted going through the process it's like giving birth you know like like when i hear you know the description of that you know and and seeing it from the man's side of you know watching you know this whole process evolve and then this incredible uh child you know coming to, it's 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 kind of similar where you know you're 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 taking this from nothing you know from just talk you know, like, okay, you know, there's a, you know, let's pick a space now we're after the space. Okay. Let's the design, let's design the space and let's, let's, what are we going to do in the space? And let's try to cover every conceivable thing because you build a studio for years of work and results. So you have to think ahead and, you know, mm -hmm. where, what might come up, maybe it hasn't come up before, but it will come up. So you want to be as you know comprehensive as possible. And then seeing all these steps evolve, and then finally you finish the studio and like mission accomplished. And then you watch the artists create and you watch other artists come in and collaborate and create. And now this space that's come from nothing uh, is this organism, this living, breathing, you know, creative space. That's just, you know, a part of this incredible music that the world's going to hear. And then that becomes a blueprint forever because this music is with us. And um, that's what, you know, that's, what's exciting to me. That's awesome. So here's a good point, uh, that I want to show you here. The overall mix and quality is so much better the last five to 10 years or so. So what, what's the important reason? What would you say? And I, I tend to agree with that now, because if you look at a lot of the pop artists today, like the weekend or Ariana Grande, I mean, they are recording incredibly good sounding pop music, <sighs> which was rare. Right. Unless you had like Michael Jackson records back in the day or Prince. Yeah. Most yeah. of the pop 20, 30 years ago didn't sound good. And now it's actually sounding really good. What's what do you think the primary reason for that is? Well, I'll share with you. I just finished mixing into immersive Ariana Grande's album, Yours Truly. Oh, cool. So I was able to uh, really get under the hood, obviously, because I had the multi tracks. Um, and man, that was like. I mean, that was so unbelievable. It's, it's everything you're, you're talking about. Like the sonic quality in the production was jaw dropping. Right. Uh, so what an honor it was to mix that. I mean, it was, I mean, I mean, I've worked with Ringo Starr, Beatle, and, you know, all these years with Aerosmith and just really iconic artists who have, you know, great music and, and a lot of iconic albums. And this dropped my jaw. Like it was, it was so good. And so I think part of, to answer the question, I think that, a big part of it is uh, that the tools are getting so good. We have the sonic quality of what we're able to use and, and without spending a fortune, right? So, yeah. so high quality and budget went together at a much higher number uh, in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And then the, the corner turned and... All of a sudden, as we get into the 2000s, the, you know, you can, the value of what you were getting in with some of this, uh, you know, some of these tools 
was just so high. I mean, you know, 24, 192, 24, 96 with really good DAX and, you know, really great clocking. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's there were no excuses. You know, I mean, the, the tools are there. So what are you going to mm-hmm. do with them? You know, and, and when you listen to an Ari- Ariana Grande of the weekend, you know, it's not just because of the tools. I mean, we're not we're not just saying that by any means. It's the producer. It's the, you know, the playing, the yeah. choices of sounds. I mean, there's tremendous creative talent that's going into this. But the tools that are available is a big reason why that, you know, we keep getting music sounding better and better. And with the better tools, now all of a sudden, as I always say, it's it's not just, you know, it's the archer and not the arrow. Well, now as the arrows are getting so much better and so much more consistent, the the archers can perfect their work and they can up their game and they're not chasing tr- sound quality like we used to have to do. They can just focus on making what they have sound great. They can put more time into it and they can develop workflows that just get better results faster and better, which in the past – a workflow was a very hard thing to to develop because the the tools you know took so long to kind of use and especially in the analog world and you know to do a mix recall i don't know if you know whoever's been in studios or there were these things called recall sheets and the engineer would go around to all the assistant engineer would go around to all of the equipment in the room could be 30 40 50 pieces of equipment and literally had on a piece of paper the front panel of that equipment and they would write down and notch where all the settings were that were being used for that mix when it was finally done so to recall a mix could take five six hours just to get to the point where it's back to where it was a week ago because the artist has changes they want to make now you recall a mix and a lot of it's done in the box it takes 15 minutes right you could recall 10 mixes in a day, whereas in the past, you'd be lucky to recall two. Wow. So all of these things combined, you know, with with talent and you look, Michael Jackson, Gene, you know, what a great example. Bruce Swedeen and Quincy Jones. Quincy I mean, Jones, those, yeah. Those mixes still to this day, Thriller and Bad are still. Their benchmark. Oh, yeah. Completely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody remembers this, but Noel Lee from Monster went in the studio with Bruce Swedeen and they played all the mixes back through monster 1000, 1500 and Sigma cable. And they created a a limited edition numbered CD. That's one of my playback discs to this day. And it is, it's louder. It's more present. It is truly even more audiophile grade than the original. Um, And, you know, it's to this day, it's, it tells me what a system's playing back like. And those mixes were from the eighties. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. You know, it's funny. I'll, I'll listen to Apple music and, and I'll let it just do its own thing where it finds your music. And I've noticed just like a whole new category of music over the last couple of years, indie music, you know, independent music, Mm -hmm. the production is incredible. Like I just can't believe what I'm hearing on my system. And, And it's like, it gets you into music you're not normally listening to right. just because you want to hear how good it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Isn't it? I mean, that's the beauty of what we do and all of us here listening today and sharing our passion um, is that, you know, it's just every day is a new adventure and, uh, and, and every day there's something that you can make better in what we do, you know, I, and, and I have the blessing of doing it on both sides where I'm, I'm making it better in the creation of music and mixing and, and what people will hear and then on the playback side of what they can experience to reference it and enjoy it um, as a listener. And both of those sides have, they're never the same twice. And every day you can keep improving, you can keep finding new tools and new processes and ways to make it better. Yeah. So is there any way, this is off topic, but since I have you on here and we're talking about music mixes, is there any way we could restore some of our great progressive rock music from the 70s and 80s that just sounds dreadful when you listen to it in digital now? Can we can we remix that or take we the can. original files and boost the bass, do something to give us more life in those recordings? Better than ever we can. You know, if the if the labels, when the labels let us get into the archives 
especially the masters, mm -hmm. there's so much technology today to be able to go in and clean up the sound without, you know, altering, you know, the essence of it and the, and the, um, the magic of it. There's so much that can be done to make it sound, you know, very contemporary and, and restore it and get it sounding great. And um, yeah, I mean, it's true. There's some incredible performances that have been captured that sonically just aren't there. And you listen yeah. to them and you're hearing just this incredible musicianship and the mix the best they could get it. But, um, you know, there's just some real problems with it. So, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to see that keep happening. I, I think it's on the right track. I think there's a lot of emphasis on seeing for the first time in 20 years. Uh, because when MP3 came in the early 2000s, you know, sonic, um, you know, interest, we'll call it, on behalf of the labels uh, was not a priority. And now I'm seeing it come back around and it is very much a priority. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot of great um, remixes, re-releases with improved sound. And that's just a great thing for all of us. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to that, especially the stuff uh, that's coming down the pipe with Emerson Lake and Palmer. I find that pretty intriguing. I can't wait to hear that. Is, is it going to be in Atmos or is it just going to be in 5.1? Um, or you can't uh, we'll say have, it. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, I know that, well, Asia, they have, uh, I talked to Carl the other day, and, and Asia has a new set of uh, live releases and some other things. They're going back to the vault and they're uh -huh. picking up all this incredible content um, and remastering it. Um, and that's coming out in June. That's stereo. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, I've been talking to them um, about, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting this all in Atmos. Um, I don't think it's there yet. You know, Asia's universal ELP now is BMG. Uh, they control it. So, you know, you got to go through the different chains to get, um, you know, get, get the right people, uh, you know, kind of getting the project going and saying, right. you know, we're going to do this. But man, the ELP catalog, I mean, freaking awesome. Yeah, the Trilogy album would be great in Atmos, man. I would love to hear that. Yeah, I think all of them, you know, just from the first album, Lucky Man, you yeah. know, all the way up. Um, pictures. You know, yeah, pictures. I mean, you know, Tarkus and Brain Salad Surgery. I mean, just iconic, iconic. It's hard to believe how many iconic records were made in a relatively short period of time. And yet they're still not in the Rock Hall of Fame. Go wonder. Yeah, different topic, other, different different live yeah, stream. Whole nother, whole nother subject, but uh, they certainly deserve to be. So this is a good idea, David, to close up the show here. Um, someone's suggesting that we come up with a reference, 25 to 50 reference tracks. Maybe you can give me a list of some of your favorite tracks and we can put it on our Patreon channel. And yeah, let's let's talk about that for sure. I'll go. Yeah. And, and, and for me, it's stereo playback uh mm -hmm. from cd and from high res streaming it's um uh surround and it's movie right so depending on whether i'm building a studio whether in stereo a studio in surround or putting a theater together um you know i have to have reference discs and reference you know content for all of those different applications and in awesome. the case of a theater a lot of times it's a hybrid because I'll not only watch movies for playback and to adjust Atmos and DTSX, et cetera, but I'll right. also listen, of course, to my studio reference playback and hear how close can we get it so that when if a client does want to listen to music in there, um, and sometimes that's an objective, so it's I already have it set up for that, but other times they never go in and listen to music, but I want to know what it's going to sound like and kind of where we're at. So that's a great question. Uh, and yeah, we'll have to do that list. Thanks for asking. Cool. Yeah. All right, David. Well, I appreciate you coming here today and dropping some knowledge about the behind the scenes and how the recording studios work and the, the process of choosing the loudspeakers. I did not know that about the uh, Yamaha NS10s. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've always known that recording studios may have not always used the most accurate speakers, but I didn't know for the reasons why. And now we know it's this reference from going one studio to the other you know how something's going to sound on a particular speaker because it's been used for decades basically is what you're is what you're telling us yeah not only reference in the studios but also reference as to what 
you know, what are the various playback systems out in the field going to, uh, you know, what are they going to sound like to your mix, right? So you're doing this mix. And, and, you know, in evolution of that, Gene, because your point is exactly right, headphones, you know, are now kind of the new NS10, if you will. So now it's a combo of the NS10 world and the room playing back and monitoring through headphones to some extent so you because everyone's listening to it on it that you you know you have to hear what it sounds like right well david appreciate it again guys don't forget about our patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics we appreciate your support you get direct access to us if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions please hit the like button hit the subscribe and give us some comments down below about your experiences with uh you know, mixing studios, if you have any experiences there, if you have any preferences and how things are recorded. And if you want to see follow-ups to this kind of broadcast, we could certainly go more into detail on that. So David, thanks again. And until next time, my friends, 